Jack, welcome back to another Mayor's Hour. Thank you for joining us. This is a, uh, another uh, great show where we get to tell the story of uh, not only a great family and a great tradition here in uh, Tampa, but uh, one of the most exciting things that's coming uh, that's been we've been waiting for for the last year. Oh, Jack. yes, indeed. Watching it go yeah, up. Absolutely. So it, we are at the Epicurean Hotel, which obviously is a, a project uh, done with the Laxer family and David Laxer of uh, Burns fame. Um, but this is really going to be a great addition to the Howard Avenue corridor. Yeah, this really defines the word nouveau. I mean, everything about it from the standpoint that it is a hotel, it's an Epicurean dining experience, it is all sorts of things that we're going to learn more about during the course of the show here. But like you say, it's a great addition to the, uh, the Tampa social scene, to the Tampa economic scene, to everything. Well, I mean, Burns has been such a destination for so many years. I mean, it's a worldwide commodity. Everyone knows Burns Steakhouse. This is really going to be a great complement uh, to not only the Steakhouse, but to the entire city. Oh, indeed. And as you say, I'll never forget my first experience when I first came here and uh, got a, a little bonus. And I thought, wow, I'm going to eat out. We're going to eat out tonight. And I was looking for something like a Ponderosa or something like that. That was uptown for you. Yeah, I saw a sign that said, uh, the art of steaks, I think it was. And I was, oh, this is like a Ponderosa or something. I followed the signs. The first thing I knew was wrong when I was in ballet parking. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> I think I spent 20 bucks and about broke me for the week. Yeah, there was your bonus right <laughs> that there. Was a few decades ago. <laughs> well, this is going to be fun. We're going to get to talk to uh, David Laxer, uh, the son of Bern Laxer, as well as Joe Collier the two partners on this project, and uh, then we're going to get a tour of, of what is coming to fruition this December, uh, as well as I think we're going to make a salad with one of the chefs. Oh, really? We're going to work with a chef? I, that's what they tell me. I hope this thing's zoned for that. I got my that. chef's outfit on. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, indeed, you do. I think this is going to be a dangerous day. It might very well be. <laughs> well, stay with us. Um, we'll be right back, and we're going to tell you a, a, an amazing tale of what will be an amazing project. Let's fight to the death, all right? All right. <laughs> Two, three. Four more. Wow. That bitch will fully inflate and you're ready to enter the water. Welcome back. Uh, Jack, we got the two main guys here. These are the guys who put it all together here. Yep, we do indeed. Uh, these are, are the primary partners. There's a number of others, but these are the two guys that have helped to make it happen. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, somebody that should be well known to almost all of you, uh, David Laxer, uh, son of Burn Laxer, the founder of Burn Steakhouse, um, and Joe Collier of Main Sale Development. And uh, Joe is a developer by trade. And so how did you two get First of all, how did you two get together? And secondly, how did you get involved in this? Uh, well, uh, David and I have known each other for a while. We both live in Hyde Park, and uh, we got to know each other back uh, when we were trying to bring World Cup soccer to Tampa. David's a soccer guy, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm in the hospital. involved with the uh, Tampa Bay Rowdy, yeah. 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 which is a great thing. So uh, I've always wanted to build a hotel in Hyde Park. Uh, I was with Marriott for about 15 years before I started Main Sale in 1998, and we've been building and managing hotels since then. And I always thought Hyde Park would be a great spot. Um, the location across from Burns turned out to be a really unbelievable spot for us. And so David and I got to know each other, and I kept kind of calling him every now and then. He was going to try to do it as a condo hotel back in the day, but the condo hotel market took a different turn. And so we decided, uh, you know, there's a better way to do this. And we got together at that point in time. About, I guess, about a year and a half ago, we got really serious and started heading down the road. Well, this is unique as a concept. I mean, when you, when you tend to think of you're getting together and you're going to build a hotel, you can say, well, a hotel across from Burns, that works. But this goes way beyond just the idea of a hotel, even Mainsel itself, uh, the original. I mean, I do a lot of events over there and everything. That in itself is, to me, a unique concept for hotels. But uh, this is even more so because it involves so many other things. How did you, what was the genesis of that? Well, you know, ahead, yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, the hotel is, you know, as you know, Burn was always into education. And oh, yeah. so when we wanted to do a hotel, when we finally came to that realization, you know, part of that is incorporate a, uh, an educational classroom, which is now going to be the Epicurean Theater. 
is to have that component so when people come for a wine class or, or a cooking class or um, any type of other type of demonstration class we want to have there, they can have a great meal, enjoy themselves to the fullest, and then go right back up to their hotel room and, and go to sleep and then come back down for another class. So part of it is the, the genesis of having, you know, full, full, I guess, world-class food and wine, but then now adding the hospitality component, which Joe brings, um, it's a perfect marriage. Now, David, the Burns Restaurant, the original, what was it, a hamburger place? It was a hamburger, so, the, you know, it's really high-end. You had, uh, you know, draft beer and burgers was yeah. the high-end. You know, that was yeah, high-end. Now, now, that was downtown, though, right? Well, they had a breakfast place. It was called Burn and Gert's Little Midway, downtown off of Cass Street. And then yeah. in 1956, they moved to this location, which was called Beer Haven. And um, so back then, they're pinching pennies to, to, to scrape by and do it. So to get the signage, they only needed to buy an apostrophe and S and make burns. And eventually, they had a name at some type of you know steakhouse or fish out. They came out with Burn Steakhouse eventually, and it grew. It sort of wasn't a planned growth of evolutionary, but my father was very, um, very much looking to be the best he can be. Now, was in, he a chef that. by training? No, no, he was advertising um, person by by training. Yeah. He went to school at NYU wow. for that. So, and he was just very curious. I mean, he, was, he just wanted to. When he got into something, he took it to the, you know, emptieth level. So. I'll never forget, he called me at the radio station one day and said, you got to come and see what I'm doing upstairs. <laughs> because, he, I mean, I, he and I were good friends and I knew the downstairs obviously very well. I said, upstairs, he said, I'm building a dessert room. And I thought, oh, you got to be crazy. A dessert room? Who wants a dessert room when you got all the steak and everything? And we went up and they were just, it was all wood then, you know, just the bare structure was up there then and took me on a little tour and I'm thinking, this will never fly. Of course, that's immediately means it's going to be a huge success. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he says, do the opposite. That's right. That's right when it comes to business. But he was so innovative with things like that, the dessert room and everything. But, you know, he was always in his shorts and his apron and everything. You never caught him. You never catch him like this. No, if he were in here doing this interview, he'd be in the shorts and an apron and, and T-shirt and, and ready to work. Ready to go. So where did this concept come from? I mean, what, obviously you've had this property for a while. Right. So what is it that, that drove you to make the decision to do the hotel? And I mean, there was a lot of, the genesis came from a lot of different areas. I mean, certainly we had the property for a long time and, and we wanted to do something better for the neighborhood versus just having it a surface parking lot, which it was used for a long time. And um, we thought a hotel would be a perfect um, evolutionary path for us. We have a lot of out of town uh, business yeah. travelers that come yeah. to us. Uh, for dinner and they, we thought that that would be a great way to wind up instead of driving to your hotel you can go walk across the street and, and, uh, and go there and certainly you know adding another restaurant we wanted to find a restaurant uh, concept that would not take away from burns or side burns would be uh, something different uh, and it's of course it's going to be breakfast lunch and dinner as well so. so tell us what concepts are here what what is going to be in this building so if we start on the south end we have the, the spa spa of evangeline which is going to be opened uh, on the south end. Right next to it, we have chocolate pie, which is a patisserie. And then we have, the, of course, the driveway. Then we have Burns Fine Wines and Spirits, which is relocating from where it is now okay. at Sideburns. So that would be the retail? That would be the okay. retail component. Um, Are you going to expand Sideburns? We're, we're going to. We have our hands full just yeah. trying to get, to, to get this um, hotel open. We're, we're going to do something with that space, but um, uh, we haven't decided quite yet what we're going to do with that space. Um, then we have Epicurean Theater, which is um, really near and dear to my heart because um, I knew it would mean a lot to my father. Mm -hmm. So, and then we come into um, right here is Elevage Restaurant. So this will be a restaurant. This here. will be a restaurant. When you can't really tell from yeah. from this, but it will be a restaurant. But I mean, people can come like going to Burns or to Sideburns. Joe and I want want this to be a neighborhood hotel or neighborhood restaurant where people walk up here because. Howard Avenue, if you come down here, there's so much pedestrian traffic now. Oh, yeah. We want the people to come out of the neighborhoods. There's such great, beautiful neighborhoods here. Walk here, have breakfast, have lunch, have a dinner, sit on the, on the arcade and have a glass of wine and some cheese. That would be, that, that's what we want. So. Yeah, I, I would want to know more about the, the history of Burns because, uh, again, I came here in 1970. And that was well underway then. And um, was that just an old warehouse or something like that that they bought? No, it was a, a strip center. It was built in the 1920s. Um, so you had Sumner's Market. Um, you had um, a barber shop, a beauty salon. You had Beer Haven there. Uh, yeah. Putney's Drugstore was there. I'm trying to think of some of the old names. I mean, a lot of people that, that listen to the show will know who these, yeah. these uh, businesses were. 
And then it was, as my parents got busier, they bought out the different um, entities and, and expanded the, the restaurant. So it just started as a little place and then became the... Well, what about the decor? How did that develop? Because that's unique in all the country, I think. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, so, so part of the program was Marriott, when we brought Marriott into the picture, because we didn't really want to build an independent hotel. Those are tough to get financed. So you've got to have that flag. So even though you won't see the word Marriott anywhere on the building, we have Marriott's horsepower through a franchise agreement through their autograph collection. So their points program, their reservation system. So when we brought Marriott down here, the first thing we did was we took them through Hyde Park, took them through Bayshore, downtown, kind of gave them a good feeling for the neighborhood because it is a unique, really great it area. And, uh, and then we took them into Burns. And once you take anybody that's got any kind of hospitality, food and beverage experience into Burns on a night when they're full, which, you know, which is most nights, we, I think we were there on a Wednesday night, and there was probably 400 people in there and the waiters were going back and forth. We took them into the wine cellar and from that moment on, the Marriott crew is like, oh yeah, we're good. we'll give you a flag for this. this is, we, we get that idea. So, uh, so that was a big part of the whole process was getting them down here to come look at this and start the process. Now, there's no place like it anywhere in the country, but the, the artwork and all of that thing, the, the sculptures and everything, how did that come about? Well, I think that speaks oh, to the right. evolution of, of South Tampa. I mean, during the, I would imagine, the 60s and 70s, everyone was moving out to suburbia. I mean, Carrollwood was the place to be. If yes. you lived in Tampa, you were leaving downtown, you were leaving mm -hmm. South Tampa, you were going to Carrollwood, that was the, the place to be. So you had all these beautiful homes up and down Bayshore that were having estate sales. And my parents loved going to estate sales. And so that's why every room is decorated differently because a lot of the, the furnishings in there were bought through estate sales at the at the Bayshore mansions that wow. were down there. We and now kind of elegant without yeah. being too yeah. we want to be comfortable. You talk about being a neighborhood place. We want everybody in the neighborhood to be able to like then come in this place and feel like it's part of the neighborhood. There's gonna be a shoe shine stand. We bought the shoe shine stand from Nordstrom's. Oh, so oh. we we're hoping guys are coming in here for, for a meeting, breakfast meeting, get the shoe shine, read the paper, you know, be part of the neighborhood. Because that's where Tourists don't always want to go to touristy places. They want to go where the locals go. Yeah. So true. if we're full That's with locals, I mean, when's the last time you drove to a hotel to go have a meal? You usually don't do that. Locals don't normally go to hotels to have dinner. They're, you know, they're catering to the people that are guests in the hotel. We really want to be part of the locals because then the, the guys that are staying here, the people that are tourists, will really appreciate that. And you're, you're right. Tourists, the first thing when you go to another city, you'll, you'll go down and talk to a concierge. So where do the locals go to eat? Yeah, or yeah. where's the best place to get a good meal? Yeah, you know, it's really important. That, uh, and it's true of the office towers downtown. I mean, we need to design for us. The tourists will follow. Yeah. But, you know, we need good design because we're the ones that are living here. And, you know, we want... Yeah. Um, Tell us about the decor of the rooms. Once you have a rooftop bar. I mean, yeah, it, I got off on a tangent yeah. talking about Marriott because when we brought them in, they said, hey, this is going to be the very first uh, ground up autograph collection hotel. So we've had Marriott and their design team really all over this entire project from day one. They said, we want you to pick one of these four or five interior design firms. So we went with this big firm out of Chicago called Getty's sat down with them, had a few trips to Chicago and looked at some ideas. We already had ideas of what we wanted to look and feel like. We took a lot of magazine pictures and kind of started going through that type of a process. Then they started to you know, take us to some places and look at this, what do you think of this? Right? So it was quite a long process to finally get where we are now, but you're gonna see things like the rope above our head, you know, that, the pieces, some interesting tile, a lot of wood. Um, it's, it's got kind of a quasi, in some ways, um, I guess an industrial modern in some, in some regards, um, a lot of natural stuff, so it's not ornate. Um, you're not going to have a lot of Grecian urns and waterfalls and things like that. It's going to be more sort of um, products of the earth, if you want to call it that. Metal, wood, that type of thing. Concrete, is that part of the earth? Yeah. So. No uh, red <laughs> velour? No, no, I think they stopped making that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're talking about a rooftop bar as well on yeah. here. And I'm yeah. thinking of like the, in St. Petersburg now that, uh, uh, what is Birch it, the Driftwood? Yeah, Birchwood. Birchwood. The yeah. Birchwood, that's really the hottest nice place popular, in town now. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. given the crowds in Soho, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, I can see this becoming the hottest attraction in Soho. Forget about all the other places up the street here, the young people are going to want to go here and, and have the rooftop I'm trying experience. to picture this place during Gasparilla oh and what this heaven. is going to be like. What are we? We're two blocks off of Bayshore. Yeah. With, you know, so at one time, and that's why uh, our chef, Chad, Chad, was his chef at Sideburns, we started kind of taking him through all the different venues that are going to be operating at this hotel since it is a culinary-centric hotel. So at one point in time, we'll have the bakery going. 
You could stop in and get a, um, you know, a cappuccino and something from the pastry shop. Um, then you're going to have the culinary classroom, so something could be going on in there. The restaurant, El Abaj, three meal a day restaurant. Uh, then the ballroom, around the corner from us here is a ballroom where we could be having some kind of function with 150 people. Then we have a terrace on the second level where we can do functions and parties for several hundred people. Then you have the rooftop bar. Um, and then you have this giant pool deck with some food service and drinks that's going to go on out there. So it's going to be a lot going on here at this property. And so the kitchen's huge. Structured parking wrapped into this project right. as well. So we have all our own parking captured. Yeah, we got 350 parking spaces here. David's got another 40 or 50 across the street. So we're in good shape for parking. Well, I think it was important for us from a design perspective that there be wide sidewalks and because you want to encourage that pedestrian. Yeah. You know, we want this to be a retail driven, pedestrian friendly environment from Bayshore all the way up to, uh, to Kennedy. And yeah, especially this is, Soho, yeah. there's so many, I mean, young people out here, they just park wherever and then they're walking up and they down walk. these streets. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be diving in his beautification fund. He doesn't know it yet. We're going to get, <laughs> get some more gas lights along here. Everyone's diving. We'll catch him right on TV, <laughs> man. Yeah, we get this street fun. cleaned up, man. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> it is. I got more hands in my pocket than I can shake a stick at. <laughs> it is going to be. But you know, the other thing is, it's going to be great for the neighborhood from the standpoint of a person who lives in the neighborhood oh. now is the three meals. I mean, the fact you can come here for breakfast or for lunch or for dinner. And get an incredible. Did you say free meals or free meals? Free meals. Okay. <laughs> I, know. Like no, free I know you. I know David's made some changes, but I don't think that's what I'm. I don't think that's what I'm. You heard that, Joe? Call you said free, free meals. meals and burns. <laughs> <laughs> but up here, but I mean, it, poor David is like, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> but it is in in uh, when you talk about the neighborhood. For those who aren't familiar with this area, and I think most people are who are watching the show, but the confluence of streets coming in here, Morrison up nearby, and and the other cross streets, Watrous and everything, and uh, it it really is so neighborhood centric. It's unbelievable. That he does 500 customers sort of on average a night over at Burns. And uh, we dug into his American Express data, and about 60% of those customers are from out of town. We think that's skewed a little bit, because how many times are you sort of entertaining somebody from out of town and you're picking up the tab? So we have a lot of out-of-towners that are eating in Burns, oh, and yes. now they can have their second bottle of wine and stumble across the yeah, new sure. crosswalk and come home. Yeah, business, business people, I mean, anytime you come here on business, people want to go to Burns Steakhouse. That's, mm -hmm premier attraction. I, I remember I wrote a piece for USA Today during the Republican convention and they wanted 10 things to see. You know, we gave them the beaches and uh, bush gardens and all of that, but on there was, I put Burns Steakhouse because anybody coming to the Republican National Convention would want to go there. I told them they ain't going to be able to go there because it's full. <laughs> but, I wonder why we're so busy. I think it was that article that you wrote. So. Was, that, was that your busiest week ever? Um, is it Super Bowl it, week? What? It was is Super Bowl week still is for us is yeah. the economic impact of Super Bowl is, yeah. is the biggest. Well, wow. so. but it's the same but it was, thing. It was busy. You've got people like the Republican National yeah. Convention. They yeah. come to Tampa Bay area and uh, to Tampa and they say, well, where do we eat? Well, Burns Steakhouse. Oh, yeah. It's got to be Burns. That's it. It is a household name, which is great. Oh, it is that. And uh, this is going to expand. The, 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 the brand, the <laughs> empire, the, the whole thing. I mean, it really is, with, uh, along with Sideburns, which has been preeminently successful. For those who aren't familiar with Burns and Sideburns, define those two. So the easy way, and I'll put it in political terms since we have, we're on that role, is you know, Burns is conservative right, Sideburns would be liberal left okay. because there, the, you have the meat and potatoes there, and then Sideburns is a very uh, chef-centric restaurant where the menu changes um, seasonally. Um, a lot more seafood oriented versus the steak oriented the steakhouse. So that would probably be the easiest way to, to put it. Do the bulk, when you dove into that American Express data, do the bulk of that 60% come here by taxi? A lot of them do come by taxi, yeah. He has a lot of people, uh, limousines that come, sure. taxi cabs. Um, so I think impact wise, we're capturing a lot of people from the neighborhood standpoint. If you live in this neighborhood like David and I both do, um, if you're thinking, is this creating more trips or is this, I really think it's a lot of these people are already the customers that are going to Burns. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the guys that I talk to, the local business guys that do entertain, they can now finish their dinner at Burns with their, with their client or their customer, whoever, and say goodnight at the door of Burns and that person can now walk home and that guy can go home. He doesn't have to get in his car and drive him to West Shore or drive him to some other hotel. Mm -hmm. And just come across the street and, and yeah, spend it makes the it, it, makes in the it easier for those guys to entertain locally. So the uh, grand opening is when? 
So soft opening. Soft, soft, soft opening soft. is December 18th. Yeah. We'll be open for business lunch on the 18th of December. That'll um, be right in the middle of the airing of uh, the mayor's yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, okay. that's why we did this. Yeah. And yep. then uh, grand opening. We're calling it our grand awakening. That's occurring on the weekend of the 17th. And we have a whole bunch of celebrity chefs coming in. And because of the interest we've gotten in this project from people that are in the culinary world, Viking, and all these different vendors and wine folks, they have provided us their ambassadors. So we have some celebrity chefs coming uh, and they've participated in this whole thing. So that weekend is gonna be, you definitely wanna mark that on your calendar. It's the same weekend as, as Billy Joel. So what we'll have yeah. to do is we'll have to work around Billy Joel. And uh, maybe he'll stay here. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're counting on it. Yeah, we'll put a piano I, yeah. up at the rooftop bar for him. Yeah. Oh, that's it. <laughs> have a few that beers be and play cool. a couple of songs. Well, they, uh, I, I never thought being mayor would require that I announce you yeah, know, too. music acts coming at. But uh, they say I'm supposed to give them the key to the city, so maybe I'll just give him a key to one of the rooms here and he can come on. <laughs> that, would, yeah. that would be a working yeah. out there. Just make sure you get his credit card. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the big question is what are you going to do next? How are you going to top this? Because I know you're not going to stop. Well, I, you got too I, much of your dad in there. No, I, I think, uh, you know, Joe and I are going to try to get this running at 100%, and then when we go from there, I mean, who knows? Um, down, 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 down. <laughs> How about we'll like a see. week at a beat somewhere, you yeah. know, where we yeah. can just relax for <laughs> Yeah, I know a place in DVI that there we can go. go. Yeah, there so. you go. Yeah. Well, I was thinking what you're going to create next. Not well, where you're I, relax. I don't want to. I don't want to go go down that path until we get this going the way we want it to go. So well, I'm, there's probably something in the in the burner, but. Marriott really yeah. likes this. Marriott has come to us and said, "Could you could you recreate this in some other town?" So. I flew up to D.C. a couple of weeks ago and wow. sat down with Marriott, and they took, they brought out a map and said, "These are the three or four places that we know immediately we'd like for you to do another one of these." But you know, wow. how many burn steakhouses are we going to find? So it's yeah. going to be a little yeah, bit of a. You know, I'm not sure I can Dave, uh, drag David, you know, to all these towns and get him to do another burn somewhere. Yeah. It's, you know, it's going to be tough. It's hard. To, that would be tough to transport. I mean, the brand and as well as you know the proximity to the restaurant. That, that you can't really be able to yeah. Yeah. No. This is one of a kind. But what, what they're talking about is, and what's neat about the culinary classroom is art, music, culinary, that, that sort of amphitheater feeling in a special room like that, you can use that for a variety of things. So we, we're not going to only have culinary classes going on in there. Cooking classes are going to be a great part of it. You know, you, you'll be able to get a bunch of your buddies um, and come do a seafood grilling class of some sort. Come have a couple glasses of wine, you and your buddies have you know an hour and a half class and learn something new that you can take home to your wife and do a... Uh, so there's going to be some neat offerings, but it's not just culinary, music and arts and all kinds of other things. It would be a great concept in D.C. Yeah. Would. All right, stay with us. We're going to meet the uh, new general manager here and uh, most importantly, um, get ready. Epicurean's coming. We'll see you in January. Jack, we're back. Yes, indeed. We're back. We haven't made a salad yet, but we're getting oh, close. Oh, I'm, I'm frightened of that. Yeah, I mean, well, do we have to eat it or just I make it? I don't know. It? I have not eaten all day, and I'm starving. And I'm, <laughs> I was going to stop. I won't even say where I was going to stop. <laughs> but it wasn't good. I can promise you on the way down here. Um, we're here with an old friend of mine, uh, Tom Haynes. Tom was the uh, food and beverage manager at the Hyatt downtown. From 1987 till when, Tom? About 2004. 2004. He fed me many a rubber chicken meal. Oh, I have had so many meals from him, <laughs> you cannot believe it. Over rubber the years. chicken for breakfast, rubber chicken for lunch, <laughs> rubber chicken for dinner, and about darn near killed me, Tom. I was, uh, we spent a lot of time together. I was always waiting for him at the uh, entrance to the barroom because I knew he was coming and uh, <laughs> make sure he found his table and oh, uh, took care of his special, yeah. his special request. But he's in the show now, he's in the big time. Oh, yeah. There's no rubber chicken in this place. Right. Um, he's the general manager here at the Epicurean. Uh, you heard from David Laxer and Joe Collier before exactly what this is going to be. This is the guy that's going to make the trains run on time. Welcome to the Mayor's Hour, Tom. Thank you very much. And tell us where we are. Tell us what this is. I mean, these are obviously wine boxes. Yes. Um, so talk a little bit about the hotel and what, what your role is and how it all fits together. Well, this is the, uh, really the first impression of the hotel once the guest walks inside. This is the lobby of the Epicurean Hotel. Uh, David uh, Laxer and the designers um, collaborated uh, you know, over a year ago on what this space might look like. So the idea came up of, of the wine boxes. So uh, David and his team went, went about collecting wine boxes for, for more than a year now. Wow. And uh, these, uh, these boxes and labels really represent the, the vast collection of what uh, Burns Wine Cellar uh, has in it. Uh, so, 
So really, we just thought it was a fitting first uh, first impression uh, for our arriving do, guests. Do you have any of the uh, screw off kinds for Jack and I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any beer cans. We, out here. we may have to special order those for you. Or we could run to the convenience store and get our normal. Uh... <laughs> yeah, the, the obviously for those who aren't aware, Barnes Steakhouse also has the greatest wine collection I think of any restaurant the in America. The world's largest private wine collection. Private uh, wine say that collection. again, Tom. The world's largest private wine collection. It's just the amazing. world. It's that's, right that, here. That, it is. Yeah. That's yep. right. Yeah. It is the world's largest, has been ever since. You know, when everybody goes Burn, to Burns yeah. and they take the tour and they go into that magnificent cellar and there's 100,000 uh, bottles there, uh, sometimes probably what they miss is the 30,000 square foot air conditioned warehouse they have next door to the, yeah. to the restaurant. So really just a, a remarkable um, collection. And, and you know, it goes back to, to Burn and, and Burns' legacy that uh, you know, way back before, any, before it was uh, popular to do so, he was buying complete vintages even before they were harvested. And, and a lot of those wines are still resting wow. in, in that cellar. And, and that's why the decor is so unusual because he's got every kind of wine you could ever imagine that's reflected in these boxes, which in turn now is reflected in the walls and the ceiling. Absolutely. So tell us where we're standing right now. What is this going to look like? So uh, there will be, uh, this is the lobby of the hotel, so there will be uh, beautiful uh, furniture arrangements that fit that urban chic design. There will be two uh, uh, desk stations here. But uh, what, what's unusual when you arrive to the Epicurean Hotel, and uh, one of the things I was given freedom to create with this, is really we, we, we're trying to create the, the non-hotel hotel experience. And, uh, and so when you arrive to the Epicurean Hotel, you, uh, you won't have a, a front desk agent or a bellman or a concierge or really even a front desk. Our whole concept is you'll be met at your car door by the Epicurean host and with a uh, mobile tablet in hand, uh, this mobile tablet right here, this becomes the front desk. So a guest never gets in line. Uh, they can be, uh, they'll be grabbed by that person and that host will curate the entire experience from the time their foot hits the floor uh, and the motor uh, uh, lobby so, till they leave them in the room. So they will handle their luggage, they will take care of making reservations, make sure they, you know, they have spa appointments and cooking theater appointments and restaurant schedule, uh, uh, meals scheduled, and uh, they will uh, introduce them to the hotel, they'll escort them to the room, they'll introduce them to the technology within the room, and once in the room, uh, every guest will have their own artisan pantry within the room. And so, a really complete experience. And at the end of the, uh, the interaction, they'll give them their business card, and uh, through technology, uh, they'll be able to send text requests uh, to that person so that anything they need during their stay will be taken care of. Boy, again, this is the technology because there are restaurants now that are doing that. You know, you get one of these when you come in and you order on it and do it all yourself and they bring the meal. But, I mean, this not only is going to be something for uh, the old timers like myself here, but young people are going to love this, younger people who are into that technology you know, I think the so much. The hotel industry is really about to change and you see it with some of the new brands that are coming out out there. Hotels are being designed right now for the future traveler, for people who, who really embrace um, technology, who use it every day. And that's the millennials and the X generation and the Y generation that's coming up. But it's also, uh, it's, it's also baby boomers because we all use it. You know, my mother texts me uh, every day. She doesn't pick up the phone and call me anymore. So, but for those people who, who uh, aren't as comfortable with it, we'll still be able to take care of them doing, doing it the old fashioned way. But we really think this is the way of the future. We don't want to use technology to replace hospitality. We want to use technology to enhance hospitality. And by never having to get in line, in my mind, is, is, is critical to the process. I've always, been, I've always thought it was odd that you would show up to a hotel, which is the center of the universe when it comes to hospitality, and then go get in line. Mm -hmm. And so you know, our goal is to change that whole process and make it a completely different experience for people. So how many employees? Uh, we, we, uh, once we're all set up and done, we will have uh, about 125, 130 total employees. That's great. And uh, they've all been hired. Uh, they all start orientation on Monday. And uh, so we'll start the training process and uh, telling the brand story, telling the uh, Burns legacy story, and start the wine and food education process. That's but exciting. you have people coming in here, and when they first come in, I mean, when people pull into a hotel, uh, sometimes they're coming in to eat, but usually, you know, they're coming in to move into a room. People are going to be coming in here for a multitude of different Absolutely. reasons, aren't they? I mean, it's going to be, so what are you here for? <laughs> you, you staying here, eating here, learning here, or what are you doing a, here? It's, it's going to be a, a busy place, and really uh, the energy in this place from, from the standpoint of, of our local clientele and the hotel guests. It's, it's, it's going to be busy. And then going beyond that, the experience here... Uh, now, once again, 
the well, the rooms will all be upstairs, but the, the theater, where is the theater from here? Because I know we're right outside where the cars will come in. And so, so just a really quick first floor tour. So you're standing in the lobby of the hotel, straight through these doors behind us or in front of us is uh, Burns Fine Wine and Spirits. Through the next corridor is the, um, the uh, Epicurean Theater. Yeah. Past that is the Elevage Bar and Restaurant. And then just around the corner is the uh, Grand Cru Ballroom. So all of that is right here on the first floor. And then just across the uh, Porte Cachet, you'll find uh, Chocolate Pie and uh, our Evangeline Spa. So everything uh, from, a, from a guest standpoint is right here. And it's important to note that every one of our outlets has a street front door. So, so most hotels, if you go to the spa or you, you want to go to a signature restaurant, I guess the exception to that would be the rooftop bar. But uh, all of our first floor uh, restaurants have a storefront. And, and again, it was designed that way to welcome the locals. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the restaurant, which uh, David was telling us about. The, um, the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about is people coming in here, obviously going up to the rooftop bar. Where will they do that? I mean, just coming in. They'll come right through the, right uh, right through through the, the lobby. lobby and then catch. Yes. And There's grab. an elevator uh, on the other side of the banquet space that will take them up to Edge. Uh, but, and Edge is the name of the rooftop bar? Edge, uh, yes. So Edge will be the, uh, you know, kind of the sexy part of the hotel. Where, where the rest of the hotel is kind of deep-rooted in nostalgia and uh, that urban chic design, Edge will, will be on the edge of the building. It'll be on the edge of mixology. It'll be on the edge of fashion. Uh, it'll be really the place, the social place, uh, where people are comfortable going. They want to they wanna see and be seen. This is really, we think, uh, going to be the, uh, a really dynamic space for us. Well, that's another part of this concept, and we didn't get to ask uh, David and Tom, but when, you, when you're talking about um, these names, who came up with the names? Who decided, let's call the rooftop bar the edge? The name itself, Epicurean, uh, coming from Epicurus, the, I guess Absolutely. the god of fine wine or whatever he was. Well, the, uh, it was a, a huge collaborative effort. We've worked with a brandy company to help us with some of this. Uh, David and his team came to the table with a lot of the original concepts. Uh, at one point in time, it looked like maybe all the outlets might start with the letter E, uh, but, it did, but, it, but it didn't quite. But it didn't quite fit. But uh, we, we, uh, Edge was just kind of the natural uh, definition of that space because it, it, it fits its location. It fits the mixology package that our uh, beverage uh, and spirits director Dean Hurst is going to curate the menu. Uh, for us up there, and um, and really the style of service. So it's uh, again, it's it's probably the one place that doesn't fit into everything on the first floor. So it's perfect that it's on the roof of the hotel. What's the, what's the capacity up there, Tom? About 80 seats. So it's a it's a it's a very nice space. Yeah. And it'll be packed on the weekends. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. How did you get started in this before your your Hyatt experience? How did that develop? Well, I. I literally was born into the business. My, fa my father was a uh, chef and uh, a restaurant owner, and so he put me to work at the, the age of 12. Where was this? Uh, up in northern New York. And uh, so... never say what town up there. That's yeah. just, you're either in New York, you from the town or up, upstate. Oh, I'm, from, I'm from New York, I'm from, upstate. I'm from north of upstate. I'm from, uh, I'm two hours north of Syracuse uh, up on the St. Lawrence River, so there's uh, not too much up cold there. Cold winter's up there. Yes, which is why I live <laughs> oh, yeah. in Florida. Yeah. So, uh, so I worked for him uh, until I went off to college. Uh, we were both graduates of the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Uh, upon graduating college, I uh, joined Hyatt Hotels in New Orleans and uh, spent 20 years in Hyatt working in a variety of uh, food and beverage positions. When I first moved to Tampa, I was actually the Oyster Catcher's restaurant manager before moving to the Hyatt Oyster downtown. Oyster Catcher's, yeah. And uh, so uh, really worked every position you possibly can in the business and, and really in the hotel business. And then 10 years ago, I was ready for a change and uh, didn't want to go too far, so I moved over to Orlando and I joined Los Hotels in Orlando. And for the last nine years, I've been the uh, director of food and beverage and executive assistant manager of the uh, 750 luxury resort uh, there at Universal. Uh, but I lived and worked in Tampa for 17 years. When you ask me where my home is, my home is Tampa. So I've spent the last 10 years trying to figure out how to get back here. Get back. Oh, yeah, that's great that you made it back too. Yeah, we are glad you're back and we are glad you're involved in this. This, yeah. is, this is really gonna be a uh, game changer. And, and you might be involved in a concept too mm -hmm. from what we heard earlier in perhaps Washington DC or Santa Fe or San Diego and yeah. a, a lot know, of other I, places. I, when I took the job, I was drawn to it obviously because of the Bur Burns legacy. I knew a lot about the main sale group. Uh, so th that's why I came, I came to open a hotel. But the more and more uh, things evolved and started hearing the conversations, I realized we were actually creating a hotel brand. Yeah. And, and that uh, is more exciting than, than I could have ever imagined. 
Tommy, we're glad you're back. Like Look forward point. to the opening. Um, stay with us. Jack and I are going to uh, demonstrate our culinary skills. Oh, no. This will be a short segment, I promise oh, you. We could be arrested. Yeah, yeah we could. <laughs> <laughs> stay with us. Now comes the fun part, Jack. Yep. Now comes the fun part, what this place is all about, and it's all about food. Uh, the executive chef is here with us, Chad Johnson. He's uh, been with David for a number of years, uh, executive chef at Sideburns, and he will be the executive chef here. Yes, sir. I've been with uh, the company for going on almost 10 years now. That's so. great. That's Ten great. 10 years started as a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> he barely has any gray in his beard. I know. There's, true. There's a lot more lately. Oh, I'm, <laughs> trust me. I, I got, I'm with you there. Um, but this is the kitchen. And this, as David and Chad will tell you, this is a hotel designed around a kitchen uh, because that's what these guys do better than anybody in the world. And this is one of the reasons why they've been so successful and one of the reasons why this amazing hotel uh, is going to continue to, uh, to carry on that Great Burns tradition. So tell us a little bit about sort of what you do and then more importantly, because Jack and I are hungry, mm -hmm. what, what we have here in front of us. Um, well, my day-to-day -day role is, like I said, is going to be overseeing the food operations here at the hotel at the Epicurean and also overseeing sideburns. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have an amazing team in place. Um, the chef de cuisine, Courtney Orr, gets sideburns, has, has been with me for the entire time I've been there. And I have Price Evans and a large team of sous chefs that will be coming down here. And, and I'm pretty fortunate that I can, uh, I can kind of take an oversee role and I have a lot of talented hands to assist. I can't be in two places at once, so uh, I got lucky and hired talented people. That's great. I understand that you designed the kitchen itself, which has got to be kind of neat for a guy about to take over a kitchen to be able to put it together the way you want it. Yeah, they made the uh, the, the fortunate mistake for me that they let me uh, start working on the design process for some other people <laughs> got in. So With uh, other people's money, that's the best, so part. I, uh, the best part of all. Yeah, it was kind of like a kid on Christmas yeah. morning. Um, I got a big uh, chunk of square footage and was told to fill it up with some shiny equipment and... Um, I feel like I did a pretty good job filling it up. Yeah. And, and that's the unique concept, as we've been told, that this is a hotel designed around a kitchen rather than a hotel that has a kitchen somewhere back in the back with a restaurant attached yeah, to there's, it. Yeah, there's a couple different phrases we have floating around. We, we call it a restaurant with rooms. Um, there's all sorts of different things. But, yeah, the, 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 the kitchen really started the process, and then we filled in the space after that. So um, I got lucky enough that I got to commandeer a lot of the square footage and... But we have, uh, there's a lot of moving parts between the banquet facility and the dining room, the classroom, the rooftop. There's, there's a lot of things that will be coming and going out of this space. Now, do you still get to cook much? Um, I mean, that's your passion. Um, actually, on the line, touching the saute pan and the food, not as much as I would like. Um, I get to taste a lot, which is still a perk of the job. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, whenever we roll out new dishes and we start new things, I'm definitely intimately involved in the cooking. Um, but after that, I really try to translate what, what I want onto the cooks and the other chefs and and they do it because I can't, I can't physically cook everybody's meals. Sure, so sure. my job is to teach what I want to the other ones. And then um, after that, I just kind of get to have the luxury of tasting the food every day. Step back and, yeah, enjoy. and let the others do it. Well, what's, what's your background real quick? Um, I'm from a little small town in Kentucky called Paducah. I oh, I know Paducah. Uh, yeah, a little, little dot on the map. And I grew up um, in a, a Cajun Creole seafood restaurant. So when I was five, six years old, I was down there picking croutons and cleaning crab. And Wow. Was it a family restaurant? Yeah, family-owned restaurant. Um, at the time, I didn't really realize what I was learning, but um, I probably knew how to make hollandaise by the age of seven or eight. I didn't know why it was came about, you know, why it turned into hollandaise. I just know how to do it. Uh -huh. And then um, just fell in the industry and it's all I've ever done. So is Cajun Creole your uh, sort of specialty? No, I, I do a little bit of everything. I mean, we, we mess the chat. Um, Chinese, Japanese, American, French, you name it, we'll mess with the sideburns. Down here, um, we're, we're a little more focused on American and some classic European dishes, but um, as far as I'm concerned, if it tastes good, it's in play. Yeah, that works. Now, just out of curiosity, for a person of your Epicurean tastes... Um, I grew up on white beans and cornbread, so I'm not that fancy. Okay, well, that, that's, that's <laughs> my kind of meals, you know, but, but what would you do as your big meal now? you got one meal, what's it going to be? Oh, like what's my death row meal? Yeah. Uh, death row meal. We'll, we'll go ahead that's and what he does on the radio all the time is ask people <laughs> their death row. Fried chicken, mac and cheese, and collard greens. Oh, there we go. wow. Now we're talking. Yeah. You're eating. You just <laughs> made my death row meal. That is perfect. It, it's all grandmother cooking. Yeah. That, that's that's that. I think every and you know you ask any chef that they'll all go back to that. That's soul cooking. Yeah, yeah. soul food. That is great. All right, so Chad, what do we have here? All um, this looks foreign to me because I don't. 
my house, we don't eat like this. Um, so we have a couple of dishes from the menu that we plated up. Um, but as far as what we're actually going to make today, um, everything at El Avage, the, the main restaurant here, is the, our, our tagline is kind of nostalgia meets nouveau. So what we want is somebody come in, look at the menu, sit down and read the title of the dish, and, and it kind of bring up some type of memory or, or something. So maybe it's it's a dish that you grew up with that you haven't had since you were a kid, or or maybe you see the duck confit preparation and it reminds you of the time you went to Paris in college or, or whatever. But everything's supposed to have a little bit of that nostalgic quality to it that you, you can have association with the dish, and then we just put a little bit of a twist on it. So it, it's familiar food presented in an unfamiliar fashion. Um, so today we're going to be doing our variation of a Reuben sandwich. Um, the only oh, difference here, instead of it actually being a sandwich, we're presenting it in the form of beef tartare using some of the amazing beef from Burns Steakhouse, uh, but with all the familiar flavors of a Reuben. Okay. Um, well, just have at it and sort of be, talk you, us through. All right. I, I got to ask a dumb question while you get started right. here because you've thrown out a word I see on menus from time to time, and I am not a an Epicurean at all. But what is confit? I see that always associated with ducks, and I've never known what part of the duck that is. Confit basically refers to something being cooked in its own fat. So oh, for okay. like duck confit, it's see? duck legs that will salt and then and then slow cook in duck fat. Um, it's another one of those terms that we kind of. We stretch the meaning of a little bit. So basically, nowadays, a lot of people use it. If it's anything that's cooked in fat, they'll call it confit. But uh, traditionally, it needs to be cooked in its own fat. So that's usually where you see it with duck. So uh, like wait till I hear about that in Southern West Virginia. Oh, when yeah, I go back, yeah. do y'all have anything in confit? <laughs> <laughs> so you talking about duck fat? <laughs> They're going to take away your West Virginia residency. <laughs> but look at that. Now, wouldn't you love to be able to do that? I, I, I can, but my fingers would be half <laughs> the off. The fingernails in your meal. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the foundation for this, like I said, it's, it's some of the amazing dry aged beef from Burns Steakhouse. Um, served tartare, so it is served raw. Um, and then basically what we're going to dress it with is a Thousand Island dressing, or similar to a Thousand Island, so it kind of reminiscent of the flavor of the Reuben. Served with simples from Rye Crostinis and then our variation of Brus or, uh, sauerkraut, which in this case is pickled Brussels sprouts. Ooh, so it's all the basic good. elements of a Reuben sandwich, just done a little bit different. Way different. Um, so for the dressing on that, um, it's actually fairly traditional um, to what a thousand dollar would be, just a little bit different. And then, like I said, this with all the food is we're taking familiar dishes, but we're just doing it a little bit different, but we're applying the same quality of obsession with the ingredients that we do already at Sideburns and Burns. Mm -hmm. So even though it's something as simple as Thousand Island, it's going to be done with fresh vegetables, working with our local farmers, or in this case, like the mayonnaise, it's fresh made mayonnaise. So, mm. And I that's mean, something we didn't even uh, talk to David about earlier, that they have their own farms from which they grow their own vegetables and, and uh, that kind of thing. Do you ever get out there to... I don't get out there. The source? I don't get out to the farms as much as I used to. Um, been a little bit busy these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the uh, yeah, we're fortunate enough to have Burke, our farmer, mm -hmm. who um, does amazing stuff for us. About three, four days a week, um, we we get our regular shipment, and he always puts a little something in there, surprises. And then um, we'll be working with um, all sorts of the local farmers, uh, which our next dish we'll be making is um, actually working with the local farmer who grows here in the urban landscape in Tampa. Wow. So, um, so basically we got a little bit of hard-cooked egg, the mayonnaise, um, cucumber, and red peppers. So still staying, like I said, traditional to what everything is, just doing it with the highest quality ingredients we can get. Um, a little bit of minced cornichons, or basically fancy French pickles, <laughs> vinegar, a little bit of Worcestershire sauce, and some paprika. So that's kind of our variation on the, uh, the Thousand Island dressing. And after that, nothing fancy about it. It gets mixed together, and so we make it a little bit thinner so it almost turns into like a vinaigrette, but it has reminiscent of the flavors. And this is what we dress on the beef. Does Joy cook like this for you? Uh, no, she is, she's a cookbook author, but I haven't seen it. Of course, I don't watch. <laughs> I stay out of the kitchen. Smart man. This is, this is one of my rare entrees into the kitchen. <laughs> All right, so like I said, at the end of the day, it's it's a Reuben sandwich just done a little bit different. Um, so we take a little bit of our beef and our what we're calling our Thousand Island, make just a little quenelle of that, and that goes with our rack crostinis. And then what kind of gives it a little bit of the uh, the finishing touch that really ties it back to that Reuben. Um, normally you would have Swiss cheese on a Reuben sandwich a lot of times. Um, this is our version, only we're using Comte, which is one of the most famous cheeses in France. So what, it's just a, what is it? Comte. Comte. So just a very uh, a very high quality. 
Um, we, we, it's just highbrow Swiss cheese. That's I was going to say, what do I go to the next <laughs> fast food place? Let me have a hamburger uh, with some comfite on it. Um, I'm glad you're asking these questions because I, I have no well, idea what. That I don't was. know what I'm asking. If you find that place, please let me know because I would definitely go there. So, um, like I said, it's just taking the same thing. It's Swiss cheese. It's just the best, the best variation of it we can find. Yeah. Um, and then for the sauerkraut component. Uh, we took some fresh Brussels sprouts and then I uh, actually didn't even cook them. We just, uh, we cryovac them with vinegar and the uh, compression of cryovac them and the vinegar softens them, breaks them down and that's reminiscent of the kraut. Say that word again you did to them? Cryovac them? Uh, like vacuum sealed? So oh. the pressure of the actual vacuum bag will actually, uh, the pressure will actually tenderize the vegetable. So okay. basically you can get the, uh, the, the texture of being cooked without actually having to cook it so it maintains the flavor of a raw vegetable. Because mm. as you know, every vegetable tastes different whether it be raw or cooked. Yeah. So that is our uh, our variation of a Reuben sandwich. Very so like cool. I said, you see the menu, you see Reuben sandwich, you kind of know what it is, and then it comes to you. It's just a little different tweak on it. And you put it on one of these. I mean, mm -hmm. like, little rocker chain. Uh, because um, these, this is kind of the, uh, I think, same bread you get with the uh, soup at, at Burns. Uh, similar. That is yeah. um, that's a, a fresh rye bread that will uh, be coming out of our bakery every day. Yeah. So and. Oh, and we have utensils if, you, uh, if you're if you not squeamish about the raw beef, you won't hurt my feelings. If, no, uh, no, is that your no. thing? <laughs> well, Get your comfy you're the up hungry there. one. You're the hungry one. <laughs> he's, he's just in from a long trip. Oh, this bread. I love this bread, too. Yeah, they'll love this in southern West Virginia, too. I tell them I was eating straight cow. I, mean, I got to get some of the good stuff on here too. Oh. Did you My get grandparents some? still make fun of me for eating stuff like that, so <laughs> I can only imagine. Mm. I want to get that. That sauce though looks awesome. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Well, I feel like the guy in diners drives and something something. What's that? Mm -hmm. What's his name, Guy? Uh, was it Guy Fieri? Yeah, Guy Fieri. Mm. Minus the tattoos. Hmm. You can taste the sauce in this. That sauce is awesome. The what is it? The hollandaise or it's uh, the Thousand Island. The thousand, the thousand Island. Island. Yeah. Everything with Worcestershire sauce is good. Yep, you're right. Yeah. All right. So it's the new ketchup. <laughs> so the stuff I'm getting set up for our next dish is actually something that we're really excited to present. Um, it's uh, one of only two things on the uh, the menus at Elevage that are carry the namesake is like the Epicurean. Mm -hmm. So we have an Epicurean Eggs Benedict that um, we'll be doing at breakfast, and then the other one that'll be offered through all the meal periods is our Epicurean salad. Um, and basically, it's going to be a daily changing uh, salad of different lettuces and herbs and vegetables. But what makes it really cool and unique is these are herbs and vegetables that will actually be growing in the lobby of the uh, the hotel. So um, you can't get much fresher than the uh, the server and the cook actually harvesting the lettuce for your salad when you order it. I told you he hadn't eaten all day. Yeah, he I just know. flew in from you somewhere. You just keep cooking. So I'm going to keep eating. This will be gone by the time he finishes here. He's liable to start on these greens, too. <laughs> all right. So, um, like I said, next, so this is the Epicurean salad. So, um, this comes from uh, Uriah's Urban Farm, which is uh, located here in, actually, the city of Tampa. And, and a gentleman just commonly known as Farmer Dave, he, um, he takes all these from, from seed. And um, once they, uh, they get to a certain size, he transplants them to a, a vertical growing wall, uh, which these are the panels that will then hang on the wall. So normally mm. these will be, so when you enter into the front lobby of uh, Elevage, you'll actually have 36 of these panels will be growing out of the wall. And this is what we'll actually be using for, uh, like I said, the namesake salad. And you can smell um, it too. Depending on the mm. season and just kind of my whim and Farmer Day's whim of what's looking good to him, um, it'll be a constantly kind of evolving salad, but it's meant to be just a very basic, um, to kind of showcase like cause this is it's amazing fresh quality products so we, we try not to do too much to it mm. um so today um he has a couple of different ones we have some red oak um some tango this is red oak red oak some tango um red sorrel which if you've never had fresh sorrel it's kind of um it's almost like eating lemon zest mm -hmm. in lettuce form um this is a uh, butter crunch and then another type of uh, the red oak lettuce, just a different variation of them. So they're all very tender, uh, fairly neutral flavor with lettuces. And then we're going to be mixing that through with the different herbs. So like for this one, we have the sorrel. And then I believe it also has some Genovese basil back here. That's four different kinds of lettuces I've never heard of. Me neither. It's all lettuce. Looks like my backyard. It's lettuce with fancy names. Yeah. And then we also have some Genovese basil that we're working with today. So. Mm. They're all very familiar ingredients. Um, it's a salad. It's not meant to be, you know, anything that's overwhelming. It's it is what it is. But um, we're just taking the best quality ingredients that we, we can and, and presenting it in that manner. 
Um, so, do you mix and match these things? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and depending on like so, what herbs we have, we'll balance them out because some herbs are a little bit more bitter, some are more sour, some are more spicy. So the, the combination um, will we'll change on a daily basis, but it'll always be based around what's freshest, and, and then we'll just taste the, the mix. Um, like these are fairly neutral flavor. Um, that lettuce in particular has a little bit of a bitter flavor. Um, we'll be yeah. going frisé and arugula. Arugula is nice and spicy, so mm -hmm. so that's arugula, where, uh, that's the one I'm familiar with. The dark one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and it's usually kind of bitter. I, it has a little bitter and a little kick to it. So yeah, that's I where stay um, away from that. <laughs> each day when we're kind of starting to harvest and throughout the day as we're harvesting more, um, we'll constantly just kind of taste our blend that we're using and uh, make sure it's balanced. And if it needs a little bit more sweetness, that's where the components that we're putting into the salad come to balance it. The vinaigrette we have is. Um, it's a very simple vinaigrette that we're using Banyuls vinegar and a little bit of honey. And so between the acid of the vinegar, the sweetness of the honey, and the combination of lettuces, we can balance out the entire dish. Um, so if you come in the restaurant and you get this salad, um, like I said, you can be assured that the, uh, the lettuce is going to be fresh because they'll, they'll be hard. Well, basically, our plan right now is to pretty much come out and harvest about every 30 minutes. Mm. So you'll literally have lettuce that is alive almost to the point that it goes to your plate. And... Uh, like I said, this is one of those things where we'll get credit for putting out something that's really nice and amazing, but really all the credit goes to the farmer. All we're doing is, is getting out of the way of the product. Hmm. Um, if we try well, to do it's amazing that they can bring it in while it's still growing. That's something. Um, there's definitely a, there's definitely a wow it. factor to it that, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, when you, I've never been to a uh, a restaurant where I walk in and then the first thing I'm greeted with is what I'm having for dinner, growing live on the walls. <laughs> um, I had grand visions of doing that with some other things, but. Yeah. I don't know, live pigs and live chickens just didn't seem to fit. <laughs> yeah, I'd come in and be chickens and pigs and a big cow out there in the middle of the, of the room. Which part of that little beast do you want? <laughs> so, but, and it's really awesome because, I mean, this is not, um, I mean, the way he grows these and the way we'll be growing them in the lobby, um, one of the challenges working with sometimes with local farmers in Florida is the heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost impossible to grow some of these delicate herbs because the heat's just so intense. Mm -hmm. But um, the way we do this system, um, just a little bit of sunlight we get into the lobby, we can we can grow year-round. That's great. So we have our lettuces, a little bit of basil, and a little bit of sorrels we're working with today. And then simply to finish it off, we're just going to dress it in the same bowl. Um, like I said, we're going, we're going really simple. We're going with a little bit of parsley a little bit of thyme, shallots, and then we just do a little bit of olive oil, a uh, touch of mustard, and a touch of honey to balance it all out. And then the garnish is for it where we kind of add, well, we can't just serve just lettuce. It has to be a little bit fancy. It's some uh, toasted hazelnuts and uh, soto cenere, which is the uh, one of my favorite cheeses that's from uh, northern Italy. So basically it's a cheese studded with truffles, and then uh, the name means under ash, and they actually rub the wheels of uh, cheese in vegetable ash and juniper, and then it ages with this. So the, uh, the entire cheese is just completely permeated with the flavor of truffles as it ages. Um, so. I thought that was styrofoam when I came in. <laughs> That's really it's cheese. really delicious styrofoam. <laughs> <laughs> and expensive too, I'm sure. Um, yes. It's not the cheapest yeah. cheese out there, yeah. but um, it's it's good. You gotta have a couple splurges every once in a while. Absolutely. So, a little bit, no nut allergies, right? We okay with hazelnuts? I'm right, good. good. Oh deal. yeah. Um, so a little hazelnuts and fresh parsley, and then we do just a little bit of shallots into it. So they're all very familiar ingredients. And then uh, the rest of the dressing on it is just simply some uh, extra virgin olive oil. Um, we work with a couple different olive oils depending on what we're doing for the same thing, bitterness, the spiciness. For this one, we're using one that's called Korneki that's from this little area in Greece. Um, another local guy, actually, it's his family's uh, olive vineyards. They've been growing for generations and wow. generations, and he, uh, he brings it in. And then a little bit of Banyuls vinegar that we mix with some honey, so just a basic sweet and sour mix. And then after that, a little bit of fresh thyme, and that's it. So all we're doing is, is showcasing a really quality product um, and doing our best to, uh, to let the lettuce shine and not get in the way of it. And uh, so like I said, if you come in and you order the, uh, the Epicurean salad, you know, you may actually see one of our cooks running out in the dining room to harvest the lettuce as you order the dish. <laughs> so if, if it takes a couple extra minutes and you see us out front with scissors and knives, you know why. <laughs> you know what they're doing. Tell you what, that... that uh... Thousand Island dressing you made earlier. That's what I pour all over. <laughs> that looks fantastic. I tell you what, you come in, you want Thousand Island on it, we can do that. I for was going to say that. Can I have some of that Thousand Island that Chad had out there? We, the we can day? do that, and um, we're even. We have another dish. We're making our fancy variation of ranch dressing, so we can. Uh, oh, ranch dressing. Ranch dressing is kind of the foundation of American cooking, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we could do that. And then, um, like I said, just to finish it off, we're just taking a little bit of the soto chinari, and um, that just gets shaved and put over the top of the salad. And a little bit of this goes a long way because of the truffle. So we just put a couple pieces so every once in a while. You're going to get a little bit of that truffle flavor. 
and then the aroma will actually, if you're eating this sitting next to somebody, they're going to smell the truffle coming off of it, so it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and so that's kind of it. Mm. I mean, it's a very Here's simple dish, um, and um, I mean, that's kind of the purpose of it. It's meant to just be a salad, um, showcasing all this awesome stuff. So that's great. Lettuce and cheese and herbs. Make a little landing area. Well, we did a good job on that. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, uh, how excited are you for grand opening? Um, excited doesn't even begin to, to, to do it justice. We've been working on the project for so long um, to finally see it really take life, and, and, and you know, it's it's pretty amazing. But uh, I mean, from a cook, every cook kind of aspires to be a chef, uh -huh. and so I became a chef. My first chef job was at Sideburns, and then. After that, you aspire to, to kind of have your own place, and uh, I definitely don't uh, th don't own the restaurant by any means, but it's kind of been my baby. That's I great. mean, I've got to be a part since the beginning, and uh, I'm just thrilled to open the doors and start serving people. Stay with us; we'll be right back. Come see Chad Johnson, Epicurean, amazing chef. I can't wait to eat all this. Right, do I have to share it with you? No, uh, I, no, I already had a little okay. bit while you weren't looking. <laughs> uh, great job, Chad. We are really, really excited about this opening, and uh, I think Tampa's going to be proud. All right. Cool. Thank you. But how, we, how does Guy do it? There we go. There you go. <laughs> we'll be right back. Thanks. Jack, I, I'm not leaving. I'm just going to stay here for the, <laughs> for the next three hours and see I've what I can tell you, you. He has been eating while we were <laughs> off camera. <laughs> I'm starving. It's not bad, you know, to come and have Burns steak tartare. The finest food, perhaps, in America. Yes, you're able to snack on here because you haven't had anything to oh. eat this morning. Well, this is really going to be exciting. I can't wait for this to open. And, and what a, a great additional embellishment to Tampa because Tampa is flourishing now. You look at the, we're still basking in the glow of the Republican National mm -hmm. Convention. We've got Bollywood mm -hmm. coming next year. That's gonna be huge internationally. And on top of that, we're in line for another Super Bowl very yeah. soon and an NCAA championship mm -hmm. game in the not too distant future. We're talking about within three or four years, we're gonna have one of each of those too. It's, it's all fallen into place. I mean, I just got back from the East Coast uh, with a group of CEOs from all over the state, and they're, they're talking about Tampa, Florida. I mean, Tampa is yeah. on fire. It absolutely is on fire. Yeah, the difference from when I came here and, well, 43 years ago or yeah. whenever it was, and, and what's happening now is, is just unbelievable yeah. because it has become kind of the epicenter of a little bit of everything going on Absolutely, here. and there's more to come. I mean, this trajectory we're on, we can't let it stop. we got to stay focused. we got to get up every day trying to execute the plan. You know, don't let people divide us. No drama, no divas. Just stay focused, and we're going to get there. We're, we're going to get to that promised land. Yeah, and and I know when we have the uh, you know the things happening on the river walk, yeah. we'll have to talk about it more on the next okay. show because there's so many things to say you can't squeeze it all in. Well, one thing we can say, Jack, Epicurean, January, this place is going to be amazing. Congratulations to uh, David Laxer and the entire Laxer family, to the great staff here, Chad Johnson, an amazing uh, culinary Ooh, yeah. wizard. Um, I got to get off the air because I got to go back to eat because <laughs> I am starving and I'm not going to let this salad uh, go, go uneaten. Waste. Yeah. You can't. So, There's plenty more where that came from. <laughs> stay with us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this show. We sure did. And uh, we'll see you next month. Absolutely. Ooh.